next plenary to the plenary two again going to be even exciting like the previous one and i'd like to invite dr malik fernando who is well known for his work related to the medical ethics to the head table uh, to chair the session over to you, dr malik fernando good morning everyone both here and abroad elsewhere welcome to this um, second plenary of the 133rd annual international virtual medical congress of the sri lanka medical association um, <clears throat> this plenary is titled promoting ethics and professionalism during the covid-19 pandemic and the speaker is professor henrik sais who is a research professor at the Peace Research Institute, Oslo, and a professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Bjorknes University College. He has also taught at several other universities and colleges worldwide. He combines his teaching and research with public speaking, authorship, and edi editorship of several books. For the term from 2015 to 2020, Dr. Saiz is a member of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, which awards the Nobel Peace Prize, having served as its vice chair since 2017. He has worked on inter alia, international ethics, professional ethics, medical ethics, the ethics of armed conflict, the philosophy of religion, business ethics, and corporate governance. Uh, Professor Sykes, I now invite you to begin your presentation. Uh, you have 20 minutes, and I think there will be questions coming after. Thank you. Be with you this morning. I hope you can hear me. I even have my tie on this morning in order to look good for all of you, and I'm very proud because I have my Colombo cup, which I got uh, when I was uh, at the Colombo Medical School. Uh, back in February when I met some of you. Uh, it is indeed a great honor to be spending this time with you. I will share some thoughts over the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Originally on the program, it said 45, so we'll see how it goes, but at least by 10:15 uh, your time, I will be well through and you can do other things. Uh, here it's six o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's the 133rd annual conference, and I'm pretty sure none of you attended the first one. Uh, but I am honored to be a uh, part of this, talking to you from Norway at 6 a.m. in the morning. My wife is still fast asleep. What I will do is to share some thoughts with you on the uh, ethics of the situation we are in, and I'm doing that with the greatest uh, humility. Uh, while I call myself a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor of philosophy. There are so many aspects of being a professional doctor that all of you know so much about that I would rather listen to each and every one of you. But having said that, I've spent quite a lot of time on the concepts of ethics and professionalism through the years. I had a chance to share some of them with you, some of you, uh, back in February, and I will do so now as well. What I'll do right now is to try to share my screen. Uh, so we'll see if this one comes up. Uh, share. And there. And if I am not quite mistaken, uh, you should now be able to see the screen. And there you even see my email address to which you may send complaints after the lecture. As was mentioned, I am also now in the last year of my six year term as a vice chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Uh, so if any one of you wants the Nobel Peace Prize, I can be bribed. No, <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot. But Anyway, uh, that is also a great honor and also something that has taught me a lot about ethics and professionalism. So the background for this meeting, of course, is uh, this fellow here. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy that the world is facing and we are not through at all. Some countries, of course, have managed to face this in quite a remarkable way and Sri Lanka is among them. Um, but it's scary because we don't know the path from here. It's a little bit funny because when you add a picture like this to either a Word or a PowerPoint presentation, it suggests a text under it. Uh, what sort of picture is this? 
And for this one, it's suggested that it's a cake with red topping. So it looks quite innocuous, uh, seems to be something that we can uh, relate to. And then we know how deadly this actually is. Actually, my friends, we are in the middle of a crisis. Or as I say to my students when I uh, lecture on this topic, uh, we are living in one of those times that will be part of history books. We are now living right in the middle of a history book chapter. Just like when we read history in schools, and you had chapters about the First World War, the Depression. This is one of those that will be featured in the future. And it's up to us how we write that chapter in so many ways, which touches directly on the ethics. It's a time that combines the unexpected and the anticipated, by which I mean that all of you who work on medicine know that epidemics and pandemics are in many ways anticipated. This is one of those things that we know can happen. And at the same time, we are not prepared because we don't know exactly how this will play out. And also it's a combination of what is truly perilous, dangerous and dramatic. And at the same time, as we all know, crises offer new insights and new possibilities. There's a saying that goes that in Mandarin Chinese, the sign for a crisis is the combination of uh, danger and possibility. Unfortunately, that myth is not quite true because the sign is the sign for danger just with a suffix. It's not quite true, but these myths uh, move. But it's a good story anyway, because we know that that is exactly what characterizes a time like this. In my field of study, which is the philosophy of armed conflict and the ethics of armed conflict, I work on many other things as well, but that's my main field of, of uh, research. It can in many ways be compared to a war. Even though this happens in peacetime, even though no one is attacking us, even though no one is out to destroy our countries, it still shares a lot of characteristics with wartime since it's a sort of exception. It's a sort of special time when we have to mobilize special sources. And speaking to you in the beloved country of Sri Lanka, you know a little bit about what it means to talk about war. And I think you also know that it demands of us that we mobilize our best and strongest values and that we manage to show compassion and solidarity in order to get through this. So it's a very, very special sort of situation. And at the same time for you as medical doctors, it draws on what is everyday to you. You know this from before. I love the story listening to, to Dr. L uh, Lawrence here, a great, great talk uh, from the United States uh, where a man calls uh, his local shop uh, because he's going out to buy some food. And he asks, do you have any special restrictions? And they say, yes, two things. We want you to wear plastic gloves and a mask. So he goes to the store and he buys everything, comes back and he's absolutely you know, flabbergasted. He, he says to his wife, but they said they only demanded mask and gloves, but all the others had clothes on, which goes to show we have to remember the everyday as well. <laughs> it's not enough only to remember what's true in a crisis. So our theme for today is the professional doctor, the professional medical profession. What does that mean? And when I had the pleasure of visiting Colombo in February, I showed two images of two doctors who were both, it seems, medically very competent. The one is Dr. Josef Mengele, who was one of the head doctors in Auschwitz-Birkenau during the Second World War. The other is Dr. Albert Schweitzer, known as one of the great humanitarians of the 20th century also a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And I ask you as a very simple device to keep these two figures in the back of your head as I speak. So what is professional ethics? Well, we have to start by defining a profession. And as all of you know, within medicine, there are many professions. And overall, we talk about being a medical doctor as being a profession. A profession is a line of work that has its own professional standards and goals. And these go beyond the merely technical aspects of the work. So if you have a specialty within medicine, obviously you know a lot about the special technical aspects 
of that line of work. And you can teach others about them. You can learn more through the research. But we would still say that someone who masters the technical aspects of her or his work perfectly is not necessarily a professional. Let us go back to one of the key questions within professional ethics, namely, what does it mean to be good at something? What is a good doctor? What is a good philosopher? which I am. And that's when we come back to Dr. Josef Mengele or Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Because all of us would say that there's a great difference between now. There, there's a, 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 a lot of discussion about how good a Dr. Josef Mengele was. But some say that at least he mastered many things technically quite well through his terrible experiments on twins. And I'm speaking as a father of twins myself. It seems that he learned things about the human body. But he did so in a way that deeply counteracted the whole meaning of what it means to be a medical professional. So the question is, was he good at what he did? Let's take an example from my field of study, the ethics of armed conflict. A terrorist who inflicts enormous danger but uses weapons in an expert way, who knows exactly where to hit, who does so with the greatest technical competence available. available. Would, would that be someone who is a good soldier? Or to take the line of public speaking, someone who is a master at convincing others. Well, we have an example there too from National Socialism and World War II, don't we? with uh, Josef Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda. And I've heard people say that he is one of the best communicators to ever have lived. And I say, no, he was an effective communicator, but he was not good in the full sense of what we think of when we talk about professionalism. So we can go back to someone who is considered the father of so much of philosophy, both in the East and in the West, the Greek philosopher Socrates, said to be virtuous is to function well, but not only for one's own sake, or for that matter, for the sake of one's profession or one's line of work, but to function well for society overall. And one thing that preoccupied Socrates a lot, and also his pupils, Plato and Aristotle, was that this is also not about earning money. That was their definition of what they call the sophist, someone who is not a proper philosopher, which is someone who does it merely for what's in it for him or herself. Well, I've tried to define what is professionalism, then what is ethics? It can be used both about theory and about practice. Often we distinguish between ethics and morals, and if we do so, we often say that ethics is theory, as if ethics is something you can teach and learn, whereas morals is who you really are, your personal morals. It is obviously about um, the culture of collectives. It can be an ethical medical school or an ethical hospital. And it can also be about the character of individuals, whether you are someone who lives up to these standards. One of the great classical questions about ethics is whether it can be taught. Is it possible to learn to be ethical? Or is that something that comes with who you are as part of your background, how you've been raised, where you are from? Today, we may would say part of your genetic, genetic makeup. Some people are this or that way. And Socrates and his uh, pupil Plato were very much in um, doubt about, can you actually learn to be virtuous? But on the other hand, they spent most of their life trying to teach ethics. So they obviously thought it is possible, but they would say that it's only possible through the medium of dialogue, where we actually are in constant conversation with each other and move each other through that conversation. And I think in times of crisis, which is our main topic today, to maintain that sort of dialogue and that openness to what they called dialectic. And not least, to teach and learn 
through narratives and examples, guided by ideals and principles that we write down, surely, but also all the way through sharing stories and sharing examples. And my friends, in the midst of a crisis, we are learning new narratives and examples every day, aren't we? How do we share those in a way that heightens and betters our professional ethics? And then we know, of course, also that ethics can be distorted and destroyed in the wrong sorts of environment. And it can be replaced with something very dangerous. And once again, a terrible regime like the National Socialist one is an instructive example. Because if we go to the worst parts of Nazism, such as the SS or the Gestapo, we know that they had a very, very strong professional ethics. They were actually very proud of what they did. They had a bad conscience if they did not live up to their standards. But we know that those were warped and destroyed standards. And we know what that did to the medical professional within Nazism. And once again, the example of Mengele and all who worked for him in Auschwitz reminds us of how ethics can be distorted. So which ideals and principles should be central to the modern medical doctor? You can lecture about this as well as I can, but I'll just summarize some of those main things we often talk about. First of all, do no harm, or if it's impossible to avoid harm, seek the lesser harm. Obviously, to have the technical competence and know-how and to stay on top of your field. The ability to learn new things, and not least, my friends, to learn from mistakes. The medical professional profession is a stressful one. Even the very best person can make mistakes. How do we support each other then? How do we lift each other up and how do we learn from mistakes? I would say that ethics is not about never doing anything wrong, but it's about learning from those things that went wrong and to become better. And we do that through collaboration. And of course, vis-a-vis -vis our patients, we do it through presence and the ability to console and provide support. It was very inspirational to hear the previous presentation about how we can do that even through social media, how we teach and learn through social media, but also how we do so much of our contact with many people through social media. How can we still maintain that sort of personal presence that we associate with the good doctor? And finally, to have a good and open culture for learning, discussion, and collegial and friendly criticism of each other. I keep coming back to the fact that good ethics is often about how we criticize each other in a friendly, building, constructive way. So what are some of the dangers to be aware of in our times, dangers to these ideals? Well, I'll talk about the crisis in a minute and I'll be finished in about 10 minutes. Um, but let's take a few general ones first. And I think one of the central ones is exactly what happens when we increasingly use digital equipment, new medical technologies that are developing at a very rapid pace, and not least the use of uh, artificial intelligence, very, very advanced and self-learning techniques uh, within computer and digital science because it could happen that that would de-skill the human actor, that so many of the things that human actors are really good at are also delegated to or transferred to artificial intelligence and machines. While these machines can help us enormously, while robots can do a lot during surgery and will be able to do increasingly more, I will venture the uh, thesis that they can never be a professional medical professional, that they can never be fully professional in the sense of being present, in the sense of being a human being that can console, teach, and learn. But that is one of the dangers, and I've been doing quite a lot of work recently on the effects of introducing very advanced digital equipment with what we call self-learning artificial intelligence. But there's a danger that it de-skills, take takes away skills from the human actor. We must therefore not have a blind trust in machines and technology, as you know well. Also, professionalization must not go at the expense of common dialogue and understanding vis-a-vis -vis the rest of society. 
Medicine is complex and specializations within medicine are even more complex. How do we still maintain the sense of being part of a larger society where people understand what we are talking about, who we are, that they feel that the medical profession is creating the basis for the common good and not floating away as a sort of speci uh, special elite. And we know in our time with the dangers of polarization and uh, populism, the uh, fear of elites that do not speak to the rest of society, how can we make sure that the medical profession is part of the rest of society? And finally, I think we always have to fight distrust, and I'm added or there, uh, it shouldn't be there, we should always fight distrust between professional specializations that we try to learn from each other, admire each other, uh, be collegial towards each other, instead of, of the infighting that can be truly dangerous. And finally, professional ethics in these very, very special times of COVID-19. Uh, which has overwhelmed us at the same time as we know that all of the other challenges that we meet are still there. It's not as if everything else is on hold. It's not as if no one gets a regular flu or cancer, or we need to develop our medical schools or ch things are changing in our hospitals. These things are going on at the same time. How do we maintain professional ethics in these times? And I would suggest the following, the medical profession, professional, should in times of crisis be what we often call the adult in the room. Uh, when everything is uh, seemingly falling apart, um, politicians and regulators are wondering what to do. Uh, people are scared. People are losing their jobs and their uh, livelihoods. Hopefully we can see a medical profession that manages to keep calm in the midst of all of this and come across someone who has control. What do we do vis-a-vis -vis politics? Well, the medical professional should be a trusted and good advisor and give her or his absolutely best advice and insights to our politicians. But at the same time, it is not the medical professionals who run politics. With all due respect for my neighboring country of Sweden, which I love so much, it's a country where many of the medical professionals have had much power vis-a-vis -vis politicians and have set policies that have turned out not to be the right ones politically. If you read the statistics of the differences between Sweden and Norway, they are quite interesting right now because uh, in Norway, uh, we had a larger sense of political control, which meant that some of the theses and experiments of the medical professionals were overruled in favor of creating safety and security among the population with the right sort of lockdown uh, measures. Now, it is still too early to say what actually worked best because there is a lot we don't know about the end result. But many have ventured the thesis that uh, medical professionals should also delegate the political decisions to the politicians in the end, and one should work well together. Therefore, the medical professionals should be authoritative, but not dogmatic. We must always be open to new roads and new ways of doing things, and we must be willing to admit mistakes. The medical professionals should in times of crisis be eager to learn. We know much more about this coronavirus now than we did half a year ago. And we have to adapt with that. I think to be someone who balances theory and practice, when we learn a lot all the time, we can also become enamored with the whole research side of this, not to lose sight of the actual practical applications. And finally, I would say maybe the most important things for professional ethics in times of crisis and beyond these times of crisis is that the medical professional should always be a spokesperson for what we know in the uh, language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the equal inherent dignity of every single human person. I spoke about politics. And politics is often adversarial. Politics is often ethnic. Politics is often about infighting between groups. But we can go back to my image of war, because in war, we know that the medical professional actually tends to everyone equally. 
and even a soldier of the enemy should receive the same professional care as one's own soldier. And I think to speak up in these times for the equal inherent dignity of everyone, it's interesting to see how the Black Lives Matter movement has become a huge movement at the same time as the COVID-19 crisis. And in one way, it's a coincidence. But on the other hand, they do belong together because both of them are about how we tend to the needs, even of those who have fallen the farthest behind. So I'll try to summarize by saying that if the question to me, and I'm answering as humbly as I possibly can, is what do we do now in order to be professional, also ethically speaking, in these times of crisis and beyond them? I think the most important thing we can do is to do exactly what we are doing together in this half hour now, to create spaces for ethics, by which I mean places physically and chronologically in time and figuratively where there is room. We have to create arenas that are conceived to be safe. We can ask each other questions. We can share both our knowledge and our ideals and principles, but also our uncertainty. Also ask questions. I think we all know that if we enter a room and we immediately feel unsafe, someone is out to take me, or I don't know what I'm doing here, or what do I do next, or, and we know that we cannot function well. If we manage to create a space within medicine where people feel that they are safe, I think we've also done a lot for the professional ethics. These spaces need to be spaces and arenas of real dialogue where we actually speak to each other, but not just that, listen to each other. A good saying that says that it's not without reason that human beings are born with two ears, but only one mouth to make sure that we also listen, not least listen to what I talked about as the narratives, examples and experiences that people can share with each other. You know that when you meet the patient, you have to listen to their story, not just examine them, but listen to what they have to say. I think an important part of professionalism is to be proud of what you're doing, to have a strong professional identity. You should be proud of each other in Sri Lanka. You should be proud of each other as medical professionals. Some say that pride can get in the way of ethics, and that is true, but not the wrong-headed pride. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being proud of representing something that is valuable to humankind. We should never stifle people. We should always be open to acting and improving upon what we know and, and uh, to give space to those who think differently. And that also means appreciating the whole of a human being. Human being is also spirit. A human being is also something beyond the physical and therefore always to give room for that dignity and to show that through how we speak to each other. There's a danger in medicine of what we in philosophy often call reductionism, that you reduce the human being to something less than what it is. In my own training as a philosopher and ethicist, I work quite a lot on the theological backgrounds, the backgrounds we get from our religions and life stances and what it is to be a human being and to see how important it is to maintain that respect and awe even in face of each individual human being. I'll end with some pictures. And they also speak about crises because they are about social distancing. And we know, of course, that one of the things we teach each other alongside hygiene is that we must not get too close to each other. Uh, I got a funny picture from a friend in England who showed me what the Beatles, the famous pop group from England in the 1960s, would have looked at on the last album where they recorded, famously called Abbey Road, where they crossed the zebra crossing in the street Abbey Road, where they had their studio, uh, where they would have to social distance like this. So this is the Abbey Road cover uh, in the era of COVID-19. Someone sent me a new image a few weeks later when the restrictions were even stronger and then it looked like this. Too bad. Or here's another one, which is quite funny, uh, talking about having Zoom meetings. 
Uh, I guess you know the famous picture of Jesus at the Last Supper painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, here's unfortunately what it would look like if he had had the Last Supper in the time of COVID-19, uh, where they all meet via a social media platform and he has to ask, uh, all right, does everyone have sound there? Uh, remember not to unmute yourself. But we know, of course, that there are dangers of distances. And I would like to illustrate them now at the end with a favorite image I have from a TV sketch. And I'm sure some of you have seen it in Sri Lanka or wherever in the world you are right now. And it's uh, Mr. Bean, played famously by Rowan Atkinson, who is talking about Jesus. It's, he's actually in church. And he's trying to follow a, uh, a sermon, uh, but he keeps falling asleep. So he tries to stay awake uh, as best as he can. Uh, it's, a, it's a funny sketch. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, and the funniest thing about it is actually the sermon, which goes on in the background all the time. And it's more or less like this. Allah, I'll do it. What are we hearing? We are hearing what Mr. Bean is hearing. And he doesn't understand a thing. My friends, many people in the world feel that way towards so much that is happening in the world of science, in the world of politics. They just hear a lot of They hear noises and sounds, but they don't really know what's going on. Sometimes they listen to medical professionals speaking very professionally, but they don't know what is being said. They feel it has nothing to do with them. It is not meant as a criticism of doctors, and it's not meant as a criticism of religious ministers either. Many are very good at communicating, but sometimes we're not. And sometimes feel that they are left, people feel they are left outside. So while we have to social distance in our time, we must make sure, and it's such an important part of professional ethics, that that does not become a sort of distance between human beings, where people don't understand what it is we're saying. Because in that sort of situation, people will become even more confused, even more afraid, even more angst-ridden. And that's exactly what we do not need. We also need perfectly understandable, close, present, friendly communication. And I think we need that within our professions as well. My very, very last image is one of my favorite images in history. It has actually been named the most influential nature photo photograph ever. It was taken on Christmas Eve in 1968 by the astronauts of Apollo 8, who were the first astronauts ever to circle the moon in preparation of what the next year would become the first moon landing. And those uh, three people aboard, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders, realized as they were circling the moon that they were seeing the Earth rising. They were seeing as the first human beings to see this for themselves our own planet rising above another body. And Jim Lovell shouts to Bill Anders, do you have color film? Do you have color film in your camera? Yes, I do. Well, snap away, snap away right away. And Bill Anders, the lunar module pilot who could never land because they were not equipped to do that, but he did something very important. He, he took this picture of the earth rising. And later that evening, they spoke to all the people on earth reading from the book of Genesis and trying to remind us that this is our planet. Every single thing that has happened in history ever, every single thing that has happened to each and every one of us, wherever we are from and whoever we are, has happened on this globe. Everything that is happening today with COVID-19 is happening on this globe that we own together. Let's take good care of each other. Let's make sure that the medical profession is one that communicates this common human dignity that we all have on this precious planet. With those words, I wish you all the best and the richest blessings. I admire the work that you do. These are times of crisis. Let's hope for better times. And let's hope that we can uh, solve the worst uh, challenges and the most acute challenges together. I remember my father was a politician and he would say when he had longer lectures, 
that um, I will now speak and you will listen. I hope you won't finish before me. Well, in this case, I hope we finish more or less at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sais, for that very really informative, instructive week. We have a few minutes for questions. Have any questions come in? No questions have come in. Does anyone in the very small audience here wish to ask anything? There may be comments from those who are joining online also. If you want to make any comments, you can use the raise hand feature and uh, make the comments. Prof uh, Susan, uh, you wanted to make a comment, I think? Prof Susan Sawyer? My name's Susan Sawyer. I'm a paediatrician from Melbourne, Australia, and I really just wanted to thank you, Dr. Sires, for um, the presentation which has brought such a reminder of the dignity and the essential elements of um, humanity within our role as doctors. And I think at a time like this, when we risk being taken over by, you know, the latest science in terms of, um, you know, COV or SARS-CoV-2, you know, the latest epidemiology, the fear that is present, that I think we are at risk of forgetting that um, so much of what we also need to provide is the care at a very human, dignified level. And I just really want to acknowledge that within the, um, the gentleness and the wisdom of the words that you shared with us, that certainly resonated with me. And I suppose that it's that challenge then about how do we achieve this engagement when historically so much of the role of healthcare when we could do nothing else was in a sense, the laying on of hands. Um, and I think it's that loss of, um, and you know, here we are in Australia pivoting to heli telehealth, there's a whole lot of challenges and issues with that. And I think intrinsically one of those challenges is um, the, the lack of ability to lay on metaphorically uh, the calmness that that physical presence and closeness historically has been able to achieve. Well, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. I'm very, very grateful for what you say and, and, and some other comments I got here too. Thank you so much. I'd uh, like to just follow that up very briefly. And I think the image you are using of the laying on of hands is very uh, strong uh, in these times where we know that uh, social distances is something that we learn so much about. And of course, uh, as medical professionals, you still have to lay hands on people. But we also know that this is something that people are often missing right now. So I, 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 I thank you for that. I would like to bring us back to Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the lovely person who chaired the writing of the uh, draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And she and her colleagues worked a lot on the first sentence. How do we frame the very first sentence so that this can uh, be what the rest of the declaration is built on? And this adjective that I use, namely inherent, that the dignity is inherent. It's not given to you by some other human being who can then take it back, but it's a fact. It's a gift of nature or a gift of God. We can use different sorts of languages for that. And by that, I think she meant that when we encounter another human being, or importantly, when you encounter yourself, you are encountering someone with a sort of dignity, a sort of specialness about them that means that we should have a sort of awe. Why was it so important to say that in 1948? Well, this is right after the Second World War. This is in many ways the answer to the Holocaust, the answer to the trenches, the answer to the nuclear bombs. How do we avoid this happening again? It's by instilling this sort of respect that lies in the dignity of the and these things can obviously degenerate into cliches, but they can also be living reminders every day. And I'd like to uh, stress that this dignity is in yourself as well. You, you should love thy neighbor as yourself and to have that respect towards yourself. And we know what respect means literally. It means to look again, right? Not just spectator to look, but to re look and, and to have that sort of, of basic respect also towards yourself. Also, when you make mistakes or things go wrong, to have that basic respect towards yourself and others. So I thank you humbly for, for what you said. Thank you. 
professor henrik it's uh, great listening to you and uh, we could remember you making a very entertaining and very informative lecture presentation some time ago in colombo so it's a pity that you couldn't be here with us uh, in colombo this time but anyhow it was a great lecture and uh, during your presentation you mentioned that the doctors should not be politicians now just out of interest uh, you may be uh, interested to know that in sri lanka this the election time and there are quite a few doctors who are contesting from different different political parties uh, that's on a kind of a just a side note uh, what do you think about the advocacy role of a doctor as ad advocacy role to the to different stakeholders that does it involve some kind of politics without being biased to any political party you know the decisions the politics has to make in these sorts of times of crisis has to be based on solid medical competence and i think we can say that many of the worst mistakes that have been made around the world have been made when one has not listened to the best available knowledge and not least when one has not had respect for the fact that for each day that goes by in each week and each month we learn more so we may have to change things in politics based on the advice and the knowledge that we get from medical professionals so i have enormous respect for the political side of the medical profession which also goes to such questions as uh, how do we use our resources best what should we prioritize where should the money go but at the same time of course being a medical professional is not necessarily to know exactly what is the larger picture and a politician has to take uh, aboard a uh, larger questions not least when it comes to prioritization what are the important things to do uh, i would say that an ideal role that the medical professional can play is exactly by being nonpartisan we can also calm the waters so that when politicians from different parties or groups very strongly disagree we can say well here are some things that you have in common here are some facts we have in common also some ideals um remind for instance our politicians of the importance of respecting the dignity of each individual and to make sure that medical care does not become partisan uh so i think uh, you play an important political role without being politicians and then i add obviously doctors can become politicians one of the most famous norwegian politicians ever gru harlem bruntlan Uh, who headed the Brundtland Commission on Sustainable Development she was a medical doctor and that's fine because i think you can bring a lot of prudence and knowledge and wisdom from the medical profession but the role of the doctor and the role of the politician are not exactly the same um and i guess we can sometimes say if we're not politicians phew, thankfully so thank you professor says it's time now to close this session Uh, many thanks to Professor Zais for being with us and sharing your ideas with us. Um, we also need to, uh, to thank all those involved in this uh, transmission, both the medical association, IT personnel, and those from outside. Um, this is the first time that I was involved in anything like this, and I really hope this will be the last time as well because I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. Thank you very much, everyone. with that uh, we come to the end of the morning session